Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, okay. This is such an intimidating subject for me. Um, so when I'm, I'm learning about a topic that I, I don't know much about, I'm always more comfortable going into it if I at least know a little bit about the time period, the time periods before or after, at least relatively closely before or after to this one. But I don't really even know about that. So I feel like I'm just totally in new territory with this topic. And uh, it's very intimidating. And um, I'll try not to pause or whine too much. But there's no way I'm going to just go through the video not understanding something. So if I do, pause too much for your liking. That's fine. Get the hell out of here. Uh, yeah, I'm just giving you a heads up. If you're new to the channel, my name's Connor. I like to learn about history uh, through YouTube recommendations. Join the Discord, all that stuff. Hit all the buttons. The original link to this video will be at the top of the description below. Discord right below that. The more the merrier. Pull up a chair. Let's do it. I've been wondering whether I should just stick with one series, like the uh, Caesar Rome Civil War, or kind of do what I've always been doing and kind of juggling two series at once. You know, doing one episode of one and then one episode of the other and a few unrelated history videos in between and then repeat. But if you guys think it's better just to tackle one, like stick to the Roman Civil War and do a little unrelated history, because I can't just, you know, the only videos I make be about one subject. I, I just, I can't do that. And um, so let me know what you think, if you're fine with the kind of juggling the two or if I just should just stick to one. I'll ask my Discord too. Join the Discord for sure. Makes it easier for me to interact with you. Okay. Let's do it. If you're not ready to learn, you know the drill. Get the hell out of here. You're in the wrong class. Home Mac is down the hall. All right? Or just chill. That's fine, too. Let's go. Oh, God. All right. So I I'd recommend watching the previous episode, but that's up to you, obviously. Let's go. Nervous. It was late 1620. The One sec. Whew. Okay, let's do it. I have my coffee back there. I don't need it just yet. Everything is good. Let's go. I know. I've been stalling. I'm going. It was late 1620. The Bohemians and their allies had been ruthlessly crushed by a Catholic army. Spanish troops were marching on the Palatinate, and the Protestant Union was in disarray. The rebel defeat at the Battle of White Mountain was catastrophic for their cause, but Ferdinand still had problems to deal with. Though Frederick V had been defeated and his military forces smashed, he had- Can I just say, I'm pausing very quickly, I'll make it brief. I'm surprised that, obviously it's a 30 years war, I'm surprised that the Protestant um, side of the conflict holds out for as long as it does. And I'm not sure if there's a clear winner it's the thing about these topics is they're in like a sea of a lack of knowledge. Like I, I feel more comfortable going into a video about a certain topic if I know a bit about maybe some um, t uh, what's it called adjacent topics. But I really don't know any to this, and so I'm just in a sea of unknown, and I'm going to try and pay attention as much as well as I can. ...not renounced his claim to the Bohemian throne, leaving Ferdinand with the task of eradicating his support without provoking a general European war. Welcome, I just he missed. had not... Though Frederick V had been defeated and his military forces smashed, he had not renounced his claim to the Bohemian throne leaving Ferdinand with the task of eradicating his support without provoking a general European war. 
welcome to our second video on the Thirty Years' War and the Danish intervention. The sponsor of this video, Raid Shadow Legends. Get that money, man. Raid Shadow Legends. That and NordVPN are just sponsoring everyone. And there is 90 deck and Frederick playing. Ooh, the maps. I love the maps. That's After what gets me excited. The only thing I have to rely on is my geography his knowledge, which click isn't on the even that great. And start playing. After his army's defeat at White Mountain, Frederick V first fled to Breslau and then to the Netherlands. Even though he had lost militarily, the Palatinate's ruler could still count on Protestant allies. The defending generals Georg Friedrich of Baden and Christian of Brunswick could not coordinate their armies properly, so they were defeated piecemeal by Thiel in the battles of Wimpfel and Hoxt in May and June of 1622. Ernst von Mansfeld retreated to the Netherlands, abandoning the Palatinate, which was then gifted to Maximilian of Bavaria, along with its accompanying position as elector. Okay. In 1623, Christian, who wished to invade Bohemia and unify with Bethlen Gabor, who was once again at war with the Emperor, advanced from the Netherlands with 21,000 men. He was forced into battle by Thiel and crushed at the Battle of Stadtlohn by 30,000 Catholic soldiers. After this battle, the war seemed to be concluded. However, the balance of power had been so disrupted that an external escalation of the conflict was now inevitable. To the north, the Kingdom of Denmark-Norway was still one of the most powerful states in Europe in 1625. The realm was not populous or traditionally wealthy in material, but had total control of the sea lanes connecting the Baltic and North Seas. Danish kings could levy taxes on this shipping, which provided a lucrative and reliable income. In the early 17th century, rulers of Denmark-Norway had several key goals. One was the pursuit of expansionist dynastic aspirations in northern Germany, and the other was the protection of the country and its Baltic hegemony from the rising Gustav? power of Sweden to their eastern border. To this end, the two Scandinavian states had fought between 1563 and 1570 in the Northern Seven Years' War, and from 1611 to 1613 in the Kalmar War. So some recent beef. The ruling dynasty of Denmark-Norway, members of the House of Oldenburg, had North German roots, and its heads considered themselves to be both kings of Denmark and German princes, as they held the Duchy of Holstein within the empire. In 1588, Christian IV ascended to the Danish throne. He used his boundless energy to make Denmark wealthy and powerful. Many of his ventures failed, but he could afford to experiment due to his massive personal fortune, being probably the wealthiest monarch in early 1700s. Sorry, just, I love how popular the, uh, the pointed mustache and, um, you know, the shoulder-length long hair and then the pointed goatee, I guess, is uh, the fashionable thing of the time. ...to his massive personal fortune, being probably the wealthiest monarch in early 17th century Europe. This ambitious monarch was initially hesitant to become involved in the unfolding German conflict, but the spread of war attracted his concern. To Christian, the actions of Ferdinand II signaled that the Austrian Habsburgs were willing to trample German liberties and increase imperials that the Austrian... To Christian, the actions of Ferdinand II signaled that the Austrian Habsburgs were willing to trample German liberties and increase imperial authority. Okay. At the same time, the Dutch, whose truce with Spain had just ended, attempted to enmesh him into the Protestant cause. Christian IV also wished to take Bremen, Verden, and Osnabrück to establish control over the great trading rivers of Elba and Fessa. Following pretty well so far. In 1624, the Dutch, English, and Palatinate invited Sweden's king, Gustavus Adolphus, to help retake the Palatinate. This alarmed Christian, who feared that a large Swedish army supported by the Dutch fleet would turn the Baltic into a Swedish lake. Okay, some so conflict there. So in January there. 1625, he offered to intervene. In the Danish system, the king at this time was supposed to be an equal partner with the aristocratic Privy Council, or Riksgrad, and was expected to rule with their consent rather than going above them. The council did not support Christian's invasion, 
so he had to raise an army for himself. In Vienna, Ferdinand II wanted to lessen his reliance on Maximilian of Bavaria, who led the Catholic League army. Enter Albrecht von Wallenstein. This scion of lower nobility entered Habsburg service during the Long War with the Ottoman Empire, and converted to Catholicism in order to advance his career. Though he was part of the Moravian army since 1615, he defected to the Emperor in 1619 and fought at the White Mountain. In the aftermath, Wallenstein assisted in the confiscation of rebel property and land transfers, emerging as a major beneficiary. With this new wealth, he loaned Ferdinand a large sum and was made a duke. Wallenstein was subsequently commissioned by the Emperor to raise an army which would be under imperial dominion rather than that of the Catholic League. He did this and eventually raised a force of around other than that of the Catholic Emperor to raise an army right, my first... which would be under imperial dominion rather than that of the Catholic League. Okay. He did this and eventually raised a force of around 25,000. I'll tell you what's going on in my head. I just, it's not, it's something that, you know, what, obviously it's something I missed before, but the Catholic League. To raise an army, the Duke. Wallenstein was subsequently commissioned by the Emperor to raise an army, which would be under Imperial Dominion rather than that of the Catholic League. That. So is the Catholic League something that Ferdinand wouldn't have control over, and Imperial Dominion means that Ferdinand would have direct control over it? He did this, and eventually raised a force of around 25,000. He informed the Count of Thiel that he would cooperate with him, but- I know I missed something, it's something that I didn't pay attention to, but if you got one of you guys could, could clarify the difference between the um, Imperial- The Catholic League. Under- Which would be under Imperial Dominion, the difference between a army being under imperial dominion and one rather being than that of the Catholic League by the Catholic League. He did this and eventually raised a force of around twenty five thousand. He informed. OK, so 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 it's OK. I think I understand it's. So it's directly under him rather than kind of being an army that. The whole, you know, a number of of leaders could technically have control over, I believe I I saved myself there to the Count of Thiel that he would cooperate with him, but would not accept being the Catholic commander's subordinate. This suited Ferdinand perfectly, as the Emperor wanted to regain a personal leading role in the war. The campaign began in early 1626, during which Christian concentrated his main army of 20,000 at Wolfenbüttel so that he could keep the two armies of Wallenstein and Thiel divided. The former had occupied the cities of Magdeburg and Halberstadt due to the necessity of feeding and paying the army. It is key to note that in this period, armies employed the savage principle of bellum se ipsum alit, meaning that the armies fed and funded themselves at the expense of the local population in conquered territory. Moving from his base, Wallenstein initially began operations around Goslar, but to be fair, it might sound terrible at first, and, and it might be, I'm not an expert, but uh, it could be either that or you don't have enough stuff to raise to uh, feed or supply your troops, and then you lose a war, and then the whole town and your reign ends, or the whole town becomes under the enemy control. And so I don't always view those things as, oh, how could they do that? Sometimes it's, you know... there are solid reasons for doing such things. It's kind of the, the scorched earth tactic. Like it sounds terrible at first, but then it's like, mm, that might be your only option. I'm not saying scorched earth and that are similar. They're for different reasons, but I- Moving from his base, Wallenstein initially began operations around Goslar, but turned when he received reports that Mansfeld was advancing south along the Elbe, announcing he was coming to liberate Magdeburg. He advanced towards Dessau, where one of Wallenstein's subordinates guarded the only permanent bridge in the region, a key imperial supply route which had to be protected. 
On the 24th of April, 1626, the Imperial Army arrived in the region. After waiting until Mansfeld's attempts to cross the bridge had faltered, Wallenstein counterattacked and routed his enemy at the Battle of Dessau Bridge. Through all this, Christian IV had remained at Wolfenbüttel, attempting to gain additional German support. Meanwhile, the newly recovered Mansfeld rushed east and then south through Silesia, aiming to get to Upper Hungary and rendezvous with Gabor. Not wanting to infringe on Brandenburg's neutrality, Wallenstein initially held off from pursuing the Protestant commander, but after a while he set off with 20,000 men, aiming to catch up with Mansfeld. It is possible that Wallenstein had waited deliberately until Mansfeld had gone too far to turn back. At the same time, Thiel That's had smart. systematically captured and razed the strongholds at Munden, Nordheim and Göttingen, with massacre and plunder occurring throughout the entire campaign. Christian IV raced south in order to attempt a relief, but was too late. Realizing he was now being chased by the Catholic League army, he retreated to the north. Tilly, or I guess it's Till, I don't think he pronounced the Y, but he seems to be a very capable commander, or at least is very well supplied because, and very, you know, has a lot of troops because it seems like whatever conflict he is in, he always comes up on top. Realizing he was now being chased by the Catholic League army, he retreated to the north, attempting to get back to Wolfenbüttel, but was harried by the enemy forces all the way. He chose not to dump the baggage train to increase his army's speed, and because of this was forced to deploy on August 27th when Thiel caught up near Luther and Barenberger. Both armies numbered around 20,000 and formed up with the Humica stream between them, with the Danish using it as a defensive obstacle. The Danes had a few go. more cannons than Thiel, but made bad use of them. Only two of the 22 guns fired at one time, whereas the Catholic League guns were used much more effectively, shooting bloody holes into the enemy ranks. After softening the Danish force up, the League co-commander, Anholt, opened the battle by crossing the stream and advancing with his tertios under artillery cover, eventually managing to gain a foothold on the other side. At the same time, contingents of Imperial Kirasir, Harkabusia and Dragoon cavalry were dispatched around each wing, and crashed into the Danes in a double envelopment. Teal Center now crossed the stream and managed to seize all the Danish artillery, as well as much of the baggage train. To the southeast, Wallenstein confronted Mansfeld and Gabor on the frontier, but this imperial show of force was enough to make the Ottoman-supported Hungarians seek peace. Seeing there was no hope, Mansfeld tried to escape, but died of disease in the Balkans. Back in Saxony, Thiel's forces now besieged Wolfenbüttel and Nienburg on the Weser. Having made his way back north after his triumph, Wallenstein joined Thiel just north of Lauenburg in September, and together the two overran Holstein and forced the Danes to retreat. As a reward for his service, Wallenstein was made Duke of Mecklenburg, an act which was controversial even to fellow Catholics. Is Thiel good or the what? The new Duke wanted another base for his burgeoning fleet, and was convinced to cast his gaze onto the Hanseatic city of Stralsund, a town famous for defying ducal authority. In early May 1628, one of Wallenstein's subordinates, Hans Georg von Arnim, was commanded to put Stralsund under siege. Initially, he did not wish to damage imperial prestige by using such force, so he only loosely blockaded the city. Inside the walls, wealthy aristocrats generally favored compromise, whereas poorer citizens, led by Justinus von Gossen, would rather resist, as they would likely suffer the most under any occupation by Wallenstein's mercenary army. That's interesting. The most under any occupation by Wallenstein's mercenary army. As the first imperial assaults began, 
Stralsund had 20,000 inhabitants and was defended by a citizen force of 2,500, a levy of 1,500, and a further thousand mercenaries recruited the previous winter. Arnim now demanded the surrender of the city. In order to add more weight... Sorry, I just can't... The more wealthy people like, let's just let them in, please, I don't... And then everyone else is like, it's easy for you to say, you, you mother... Oh, God, that's, that's telling. ...and was defended by a citizen force of 2,500, a levy of 1,500, and a further thousand mercenaries recruited the previous winter. Arnim now demanded the surrender of the city. In order to add more weight to imperial demands, he seized the island of Danholm, just off the eastern edge of the harbour, and this managed to put cannons in range of the city. However, Arnim had no fleet and could not resupply his force. The relatively small Stralsund navy managed to blockade the trapped Imperials on the island until it surrendered on the 15th of April, depriving their forces of a few cannons. Over the next month, 6,000 reinforcements arrived at the Imperial siege lines, which prompted Arnim to command a night assault, but this was repelled relatively easily and the attackers retreated. Seeing the initial success of the defenders, Christian IV, who had retreated into Good Denmark, job. sent 1,000 Scots and Germans to assist the town under the command of Heinrich Hulk. After a few more small-scale repulsed attacks on the 26th and 20th... I don't know why I'm, I've been like... I always like pick a side in a history series, especially when I don't know much about it. I don't really think there is much of an out... I, like, I don't know what... Is it the Treaty of Westphalia? Is that that's at the end of this war, or is that a different time? Maybe I do know what happens. I don't know much, but I, I tend to just my my mind just tends to kind of pick sides, and I kind of root. And so this time I'm like picking. I'm just like happier when the Protestants get wins, even though I've I have no. You know, I should have no preference really. It has nothing to do with me, but. Um. Well, I guess in some ways it's uh, getting ahead of myself, but sometimes I just kind of like root for the underdog, I guess. After a few more command of Heinrich Hulk, sent Germans to assist the town and retreated into Denmark, sent 1,000 Scots and Germans to assist the town under the command of Heinrich Hulk. After a few more small-scale repulsed attacks on the 26th and 27th of May, Arnim resorted to repeated massive artillery bombardments as he waited for Wallenstein to arrive. 600 more reinforcements arrived on June 20th under the Swedish flag. Three days later, the town concluded a 20-year-long alliance with the King of Sweden, Gustavus Adolphus, who then chose to garrison the town. This was the beginning of Sweden's intervention in the Thirty Years' War. Gustav. I know there are like a bunch of different Gustavs and Gustavuses in uh, Sweden. And I don't know enough about it, and so they're all just kind of one person in my mind. And I'm sorry about that, Melkor, <laughs> Emperor, not Emperor of Rome, American, uh, it's Melkor and Lydic's Heaven. Sorry about that. Beginning and any other Sweden's Swedes? intervention in the Thirty Years' War. The siege intensified on June 27th when Albrecht von Wallenstein arrived in person. He took command of the Imperial forces from Arnim and renewed the assaults with a great intensity. In these attacks, the Scottish forces were defending the key eastern district of Franken under the command of Robert Munro. While they distinguished themselves and managed to repulse the attackers, 500 of the 900 Scots were killed and a further 300 were wounded, including Munro himself. So almost all of them during the following night, injured. Wallenstein succeeded in taking the outer fortifications of the city, but could not progress any further. Instead, he again resorted to mass bombardments with his heavy guns. On the following morning, the Duke of Pomerania, Bogusław XIV, sent envoys to urge Stralsund to surrender, but they refused. On June 30th, more Swedish vessels arrived and reinforced the defenders with a further 600 that soldiers -day Poland? under heavy fire from the Imperial um, cannons, Pomerania? which were now wary of any ships approaching. 
The situation began to change on the 17th of July, when Alexander Leslie arrived with 1,100 more Scots. He almost immediately sallied out of the defences and launched an audacious attack on the siege lines, inflicting many losses. The next week was decisive. Inclement weather, in the form of heavy rainfall between the 21st and 24th of July, turned the battlefield into a sea of mud, making the attacker's situation untenable. Finally, on the 4th of August, Wallenstein lifted the siege. For the first time in the... Th I know there's only a few minutes left, but I'm gonna go take a piss. Sorry. Let's go. On the 4th of August, I washed my hands. Wallenstein lifted the siege. For the first time in the Thirty Years' War, Albrecht von Wallenstein had been defeated. Christian IV wished to capitalize on the Protestant success at Stralsund and again began to raise an army on the island of Usedom. On the 11th of August 1628, Christian marched to Volgast and captured it, meeting no resistance from the imperial garrison. The Danish king was then met with overwhelming support from the local population to turn Volgast into a fortress like Stralsund. He then awaited Wallenstein for the final battle. Don't worry, I, I understand. If I was at all lost from my pee break there, I would rewind. I, I understand what's going on. They retreated. Uh, Wall Wallenstein. Wallenstein. Wallenstein sounds so much worse. Wallenstein. First defeat. Protestants gain a win. The Imperial commander had withdrawn from Stralsund after his defeat and headed east to face the new Danish force in the field with 7,000 troops, consisting of- Sorry, oh. Double wash, the wash and the hand sanitizer. Safety first. Ah, too much hand sanitizer to face the new Danish force in the field with 7,000 troops, consisting of 33 infantry companies, 20 cuirassier companies, and 11 cannon. The Danish army had 6,000 soldiers, including 1,000 troops, consisting of 33 infantry companies, 20 cuirassier companies. Cuirassier? What is a cuirassier company? ...and 11 cannon. The Danish army had 6,000 soldiers, including 1,500 cavalry and 400 Scots from the Donald Mackay regiment. Wallenstein attacked on the 22nd of August, quickly wiping out the Danish right flank and killing 1,000 Danish troops, capturing another 600. I love how we didn't say Scottish infantry or cavalry or, or whatever, they're just like, and Scots and killing 1,000 Danish troops, capturing another 600. Nightfall allowed Christian and some of his troops to retreat on their ships. Volgast was badly burned and looted, and the Danish garrison had to surrender. This was the final stage of the Danish intervention on behalf of the Protestant cause, and it seemed as though the Catholic cause was once again ascendant. Hold on. The Danish recaptured quickly Donald Rogers, including 1,500 cavalry and 400 Scots from the Donald Mackay regiment. Wallenstein attacked on the 22nd of August, quickly wiping out the Danish right flank and killing 1,000 Danish troops, capturing another that 600. That didn't last very long. Nightfall allowed Christian and some of his troops to retreat on their ships. Volgast was badly burned and looted, and the Danish garrison had to surrender. This was the final stage of the Danish intervention on behalf of the Protestant cause, and it seemed as though the Catholic cause was once again ascendant. However, Stralsund showed that the tide was gradually turning. Yeah, I Two guess. Two events in the next year, 1629, would affect how the war would progress. First, the Peace of Lübeck ended the conflict between Wallenstein and Christian the- Can I read that? Oh, God. Freedoms. What is this in like Old Dutch? 1629, Alhir U Lubeck Sivichin, the Romansh 
I know I sound like an idiot, but I'm doing it anyway. Do Den... Denimad Norwegian. That must be Denmark. Norway. Genius. Deutsch, Deutsch, die Home Comifarian Bib off Rafer off Rene Rath. The fourth, both of whom now needed peace. The agreement was remarkably lenient to the ostensibly humble Danish king, who was allowed to retain his pre war position on the condition that he would promise not to militarily intervene on the side of the Protestants again. Second was the Edict of Restitution, a decree which attempted to retroactively enforce the Clause of Augsburg that Catholic lands were no longer to be held by Protestants. This was a bold enough act to cause many moderate Lutherans, who had kept silent up until now, led by the Elector of Saxony, to become increasingly threatened. However, they were now on their own again until a new force would appear to once again Yourself? intensify the Thirty Years' War the Kingdom of Sweden, led by Gustavus Adolphus. We'll talk about it in the next video on the Thirty Years' War, so make sure you are subscribed to... Amazing channel. It does feel like it kind of tricked us at the... Not tricked us, other uh, channel, but um, I was like, oh, wow. um, You know, the Protestants get a big victory, and then immediately there's a, another attack, and they get pushed out. But, hey, great video. I feel a little bit more comfortable. I feel like I followed that pretty well, especially considering my lack of knowledge of the conflict to begin with. Great video. See you guys next time. Another one soon.